Thank you all for coming. I'm Megan Doherty, the director of the Museum of the White Mountains. It's great to have so many of you on Zoom and, and those of you who made the, the trip out tonight to be in person with us. We're glad to have you. As we gather today, we're all on Indigenous lands. For those of you joining us from home, I encourage you to learn more about the Indigenous presence in your area, both past and present. For those of us at the museum, we are on Indakina, which is the ancestral and present homelands of the Abnaki, Pemcook, and Wabnaki peoples. And we're grateful for their stewardship of these lands and waterways. For those of you on Zoom, we've put some links in the chat where you can learn more about the indigenous histories of your place at native-land.ca, as well as the Abenaki people of Northern New England through the Musée des Abenaki in Quebec. Our speaker tonight is Jill Van Tongeren, Chair of the Department of Earth and Climate Sciences at Tufts University. Her geologic research has taken her to all seven continents, and she maintains active research projects in Antarctica, South Africa, Oman, and the White Mountains of New Hampshire. While we had hoped she'd be driving over from her family's place in Romney tonight, we're grateful for her flexibility and willingness to join us on Zoom instead. And I'm excited to learn about the volcanic origins of the Cannon Cliff and the Old Man of the Mountain. And our event tonight is made possible with support from the New Hampshire Humanities in partnership with the National Endowment for the Humanities. And you can learn more at www.nhhumanities.org. And that link should be in the chat as well if you're interested to learn more. And at this point, I will turn it over to Jill. Well, thank you very much, Megan, uh, for inviting me to come and speak to you today about some new research that we have been doing in the last couple of years um, that we actually got started during those COVID times um, while we were up in our house in Rumney. Um, so let me share my screen. And I wanna to talk to you today um, about the old man um, and about uh, what we are calling the, the birth of the old man. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, Cannon Cliff and about the old man near the end, but I also wanna set the stage for just the rich variety of different types of magnetism that New Hampshire has experienced um, during its formation history. Um, so this is going to be sort of a a general overview of New Hampshire geology, particularly as I am a uh, igneous petrologist, that means that I study magmas. Um, and so <clears throat> and my focus in talking to you about the New Hampshire geology is going to be mostly on the geologic um, origin of magmas. And it is a great thing that uh, New Hampshire is called the granite state uh, because there are a lot of granites to study here. So, okay, let's begin. Um, I'm gonna tell you a, a geologic history of mountains, volcanoes, and oceans, all of which New Hampshire has experienced during the last 500 million years. Okay. Um, here is, of course, is, a, is the picture of uh, where the old man is now. Uh, unfortunately, um, oh, you know what? Can you see my, uh, my cursor when I cover over it? Yes, we can, you can see it. Okay, so um, here is Cannon Cliff uh, that you all know up in Franconia Notch, um, and it's infamous debris pile, and I call it infamous for several reasons. One, because this is where, unfortunately, the face of the old man now lies. Um, and we've heard, I think you guys have heard in the the course of this series um, this summer about a lot of the valiant efforts that were made to try to preserve uh, the face and um, bolster what is um, only a natural process of destruction of these mountaintops uh, due to weathering and frost heave and so on and so forth. And you can see that a lot of Cannon Cliff has experienced significant uh, rock fall uh, over the years to make this very large debris pile here. So Cannon Cliff and the Old Man are known uh, to geologists as the Conway granite. So I'm showing here um, what the, the Cannon Cliff rocks look like um, when you get up close to them. 
They are granites. They granites are is a term uh, for a rock type that can that includes feldspars, quartzes, um, another type of feldspar called plagioclase. And in lots of cases, they also include a black or darker phase. And that phase can be usually things like hornblende or biotite. And so in the case of the Conway granite, um, and I'll show a picture of what biotite and hornblende look like in a minute um, and how to distinguish them. But in the case of the Conway granite, this uh, the old man was composed of these feldspars, quartz, and a biotite mafic phase or dark phase. Um, and that's what we think of as the Conway granite. And the Conway granite um, is found throughout all of this yellow area here on this generalized geologic map. So this is a geologic map, um, very generalized from a much more detailed map that we'll see in a second, of different rock types that form in New Hampshire. And what you can see is that a lot of the state is dotted by this yellow uh, color here. So this yellow color represents granites and magmas that were formed um, during the Jurassic, the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. And if those time periods sound familiar to you, that is because that is the time periods that dinosaurs were living on the earth, right? So a lot of these uh, magmas uh, were coming up uh, at the time when, uh, the, when the dinosaurs were roaming the region. Okay, so these uh, this generalized map shows where uh, the Conway granite and Cannon Cliff is here, over here in Franconia, and you can see that it is a very large swath of New Hampshire. So over here, we've got Franconia Notch. Over here, we've got Conway, uh, the town of Conway, the city of Conway over here, and it comprises this very large white mountain uh, batholith, this large voluminous region. But you can also see that there are yellow splotches dotted all the way from Lake Winnipesaukee near uh, Laconia, all the way up from south to north near Coldbrook in the Vermont border up here. So this is a very large region of magnetism that all formed around the same time period as the, as the Conway granite and the White Mountain Magma series were coming up. And the reason why I mentioned the White Mountain Magma series is that it's not just one yellow blob, but when we actually dig a little deeper into the detailed geologic uh, map of the region, we can see now here I am zooming in only on this big, large yellow swath, this white mountain batholith. Um, we can see that the, the white mountain magma series that the Conway granite and the old man are a part of are actually multiple different types of magma. And so in, when we make a geologic map, we label different types of magma with different colors and different symbols. So here, the old man and the Conway granite is represented by this light yellow color. But there are other types of granites and um, uh, felsic igneous rocks that uh, also come up around the same time. So there are uh, another type of rock type called the Osceola granite, named after Mount Osceola in New Hampshire, and the Lafayette cyanite, named after Mount Lafayette up here. So we're going to get into a lot of the details of this um, in a little bit, but I first want to zoom out and kind of set the stage for the arrival of the White Mountain Magma series. Um, so there is a reason luckily, why we call New Hampshire the granite state. And that is because there are generally thought to be three major episodes of granite magnetism represented in New Hampshire. And each of these three different episodes that happen at different time periods uh, represent different tectonic settings um, within the amalgamation of the North American continent. So the first one that I wanna point out um, is called the New Hampshire Plutonic Suite. And the New Hampshire Plutonic Suite on this generalized geologic map uh, crops out in a lot of these um, sort of lighter pinks uh, down here from within the Ordovician, Silurian, and Devonian time period. Okay, so these are uh, places like, for example, Mount Cardigan. Some of you have maybe um, been out hiking um, Mount Cardigan State Park. Um, it's a very beautiful hike with gorgeous views of the entire uh, region. 
This is a group of my students um, from Tufts uh, on a mineralogy, oopsies, on a mineralogy field trip uh, last fall, where we hiked up uh, and, and got to see a lot of these granites here. So one thing that you might see when we look at this Mount Cardigan Pluton is that it looks a lot different than the Conway granite that I just showed. And it looks a lot different from that Con Cannon Cliff picture that I showed before. So this Mount Cardigan Pluton is formed in a much different tectonic setting and has different sort of chemistry and characteristics than what we see in uh, Cannon Cliff and in the White Mountain Batholith. So this is part of the New Hampshire Plutonic Suite. Another uh, thing that maybe many of you in New Hampshire have heard of are these pegmatite mines that dot um, the area near Mount Cardigan um, and Dorchester and those regions. Uh, these are places like the Palermo pegmatite mine that the students are picking around in. These are huge um, mega crystal, uh, mega sized crystals of things like feldspar and quartz and micas, particularly muscovite micas, those white micas. Um, the Palermo pegmatite mine uh, was previously in the early 1900s mined for um, this, mi this white mica, big sheets of white mica that were used for glass panes, glass window panes, um, and for furnace liners. So here are the students here digging around in here, all part of this New Hampshire plutonic suite that was active from about 410 million years ago uh, to 365 million years ago. And there are a couple interesting things about this New Hampshire plutonic suite, which also dots a very large swath of New Hampshire. Um, People have debated whether these granites formed in a subduction zone type setting. So in a place like um, uh, the Philippines or Japan, where you have two ocean plates that meet one another and start subducting and they trigger this granitic magmatism and volcanism. Um, so that is one possibility. Another possibility is that these are partial melts, so melts um, of the crustal material that magmas were rising up through, and those created these, um, these large volumes of granite magmatism um, in New Hampshire. One thing that I do want to say, though, is that at this time, New Hampshire did not exist. So as these guys were um, coming up into the crust, the reason why I mentioned places like the Philippines or Japan is because right uh, during this New Hampshire plutonic sweep formation around 400 million years ago, uh, the, the continent of North America did not yet exist in this location. So here's a really fun image of some uh, geographic reconstructions uh, that we have using um, paleomagnetism. So, uh, uh, signatures from the Earth's magnetic field through time, and we can sort of track where continents are and where rocks are formed. And there's a really fun website uh, that I've listed down here that I would very much encourage everyone to take a look at. And you can plot, uh, you can put it in your address on this website, and it will plot where you were, where you're standing. 400 million years ago, 300 million years ago, 200 million years ago, and you can see how the continent that you're standing on today changed location and was built up over successive time periods. It's really quite enjoyable. So here I've put in Plymouth, New Hampshire in this little red dot pointing down here, and you can see that at 400 million years ago, as this New Hampshire plutonic sweet granites were forming, things like the Mount Cardigan pluton, um, the Kinsman granodiorite, Bethlehem granodiorite, things like this, um, all those pegmatites, there was actually no continental crust close by, but instead we start forming what's, re what's referred to as a ribbon continent. So it's a continental fragment, kind of like what the Philippines is today. And this was forming offshore from the, the, the paleo margin or the, the, pre, the past margin of North America. And at this time, that margin was located more or less around Vermont um, and upstate New York. So at 400 million years ago, the rocks that we currently see in New Hampshire 
We're offshore of North America in this little ribbon continent here. That's when the when those those granites were being formed. As time passed, a lot of the sediments that were coming off of these this ribbon continent into the ocean, sitting over here, uh, were being deposited, and new continents were starting to come closer and closer. So here's Plymouth over here. You can see that uh, parts of Africa have now collided with it. Um, and we're starting to get a little bit more of this North American margin, oop, more North American margin coming closer. So this is very similar to what we see even in the present day where these continents are starting to, these ribbon continents attached to um, continental fragments and continental margins off, offshore. And this is how we generally think that continental crust gets constructed um, and added to uh, through time. So here at about 300 million years, you can see that, that Africa has now collided with this ribbon continent and we're starting to get tons and tons of metamorphism. And so people who live in um, the Plymouth area or in Rumney, like I do, um, you will be very familiar with the Rumney Rocks climbing uh, area. So the Rumney Rocks climbing area is actually a bunch of metamorphosed sediments that are associated with this closure of that ocean basin between Africa and this ribbon continent at around 300 million years ago, or even a little bit, uh, a little bit older. So a lot of that metamorphism is happening. This is when um, the metamorphic rocks that we see at the top of Mount Washington, for example, are forming um, and becoming very hard and rigid blocks. And as we progress a little bit further in time, we, uh, we close up all of those ex existing ocean basins. And you can see here we are in, um, in New Hampshire up here. And you can see that all of those continents have come together by about 200 million years. Um, they've generally come together a little bit earlier than this, maybe around 250 million years ago. But at around 200 million years, all of the continents are together. Um, and here we are in this mountain range um, called the Appalachians. So this is the formation of the Appalachians um, and this large mountain belt that runs basically from Georgia all the way up um, through into Nova Scotia and across the pond over into Scotland and the British Islands. And then we see that's all part of this one system um, and this formation of the supercontinent of Pangaea. Okay. So I go through all of this because at around 200 million years, something really starts happening um, underneath this supercontinent. And it turns out that supercontinents sort of have a love-hate relationship with each other, where they like to come together, and then they like to break apart, and then they like to come together again, and then they like to break apart a little bit more. This is such a constant theme throughout geologic history of the Earth that we actually have a name for this, this process of supercontinent formation and destruction. It's called the Wilson cycle. So in the Wilson cycle, in um, this Wilson cycle of supercontinent formation, we have, um, for example, a young, what, what we call young passive margin. So this is an area of rifting, where the continents are moving apart from one another, oceans are, are, are starting to form, um, the mid-ocean ridges like we see in the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean today, where the crust is being actively pushed apart and new oceanic crust is forming. These are all part of this motion of the continents together and apart over time. So very frequently we see the formation of these passive margins, active mid-ocean ridges, and then those ridges then get subducted near another continental margin. And with time, they come back together again. And it turns out that when these continents break up, when these big stable continents like Pangaea break apart from one another, they do it in a pretty catastrophic way. And so a lot of what happens is as they're starting to pull apart from each other, the mantle beneath the crust becomes, um, de it decompresses, kind of like taking uh, the lid off of your soda bottle. 
And so as your mantle starts to see this rifting process of the continents drifting away from each other, that creates huge volumes of magma that get emplaced into the crust. We see this all over the place through a lot of different, um, of different cycles of the supercontinent cycle. Around 200 million years ago in North America, on the Eastern side of North America, we had this, Pangaea started to break up. So this big supercontinent here of Pangaea in gray starts to break up and we get basalts. So magmas from deep in the mantle that come up into the crust and get emplaced into the near surface. And this, um, these basalts associated with this 200 million year ago breakup of Pangaea are collectively called the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province or um, colloquially CAMP. So CAMP is Central Atlantic Magmatic Province and it stretches all the way from Eastern North America shown here into Central America, uh, South America, Africa, um, and over into um, Southern Europe as well. And those of you who have been to New York City have seen an ex a very nice example of uh, these basalts that get emplaced. This is the Palisade Sill, which is basically the backdrop to all of New York City. So as you look across, if you're in the city in Manhattan and you look across the river to New Jersey, you'll see a big cliff. And those are basalts that were erupted during this formation of the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. The same types of basalts that we see in New York City are also found in places like the Atlas Mountains in Morocco. So we know that these were all part of this very large um, region of magmatism uh, during this rifting of Pangaea around 200 million years ago. And not to be outdone, New Hampshire also has examples of these basalts, though not, not in the same way as the Atlas Mountains and the Palisade Sill. We have um, a lot of black rock um, that forms what are called dikes. So dikes are um, in, intrusions of uh, vertical intrusions of basalt uh, within the crust. And one of the places that you can go and see this Central Atlantic Magmatic Province basalt is in the Flume Gorge in Franconia Notch State Park. So um, what the, the, the black rock, that uh, the dike rock, this basalt, is actually what is creating that flume. So the basalt gets weathered away more quickly than the granite that's around it, or the, the metamorphic sediments that are around it. And the, and the water preferentially goes through um, where the basaltic dike was. And so if you get up close to the flume gorge and it's not overflowing with water too uh, vigorously, you can kind of peek in there and see that there's a big black uh, vertical stripe running through the rocks. And that is this Central Atl Atlantic Magmatic Province um, dikes. You can also see examples of these dikes um, sort of cross-cutting a lot of the granites um, in near Waterville Valley uh, on the Welch Dickey Trail and things like this as well. So we have plenty of examples, just not in the sort of stunning way of the Palisade Sill or, or the Atlas Mountains. Um, but this Central Atman Atlantic Magmatic Province dikes are found th throughout the Appalachians from Georgia all the way up to Nova Scotia here. And when these basalts erupt, they can frequently cause really big environmental changes. And so um, the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province basalts are typically thought to correlate or cause what's known as the end triassic magmatic or, or the end triassic mass extinction. So this is a famous plot of Cordio and Rene in 2003, where they looked at all of the big basaltic um, magmatism associated with these big supercontinent rifting events um, through time. They showed that um, many of these big basaltic eruptions are also associated with the um, with known mass extinction events or big environmental changes within the ocean. So ocean anoxic events where the ocean becomes basically free of oxygen and nothing can survive. 
So the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province is here at about 200 million years ago, and this is thought to trigger the end Triassic mass extinction. The end Triassic is a big one. Um, at this time, about 76% of all life on Earth went extinct. Um, and it was the end Triassic that actually gave rise to or killed off all of the competition for the dinosaurs. So there were a few dinosaurs in the Triassic that were starting to, um, to emerge. Uh, and we think that the, these dinosaurs were actually really well suited to the um, environmental changes that occurred during this uh, flood basalt volcanism, this camp basalt volcanism, and that other animals that may have been in competition with the dinosaurs were not well suited and those died out. And so it was this end Triassic extinction event that actually made it easier for the dinosaurs to become the big behemoths that they became in the end. Um, until of course the Deccan and the Chicxulub uh, meteorite impact sort of collectively combined together to uh, cause the end Cretaceous or the, um, the, the extinction of the dinosaurs at about 65 million years ago. Okay, so these flood basalts, these basalts that are associated with the breakup of Pangaea or breakup of supercontinents can do huge, um, can be huge volumes of magma and they can do a lot of damage um, to life and environment on the earth. But what does this have to do with the old man of the mountain, right? That we're here today to talk about the formation or the birth of the old man of the mountain. And it turns out that not only do these basalts dot all the way along the North American margin and into Morocco, but they also, um, but they also seem to come out all at about 201.5 million years ago. So this is some work that was done about 10 years ago uh, by Terry Blackburn and colleagues, where they looked at tons of different locations where these basalts um, occurred, and they found that they all came out at around 201 million years ago. Um, the White Mountain Batholith, or the White Mountain Magma Series that forms the Conway Granite um, and the Old Man of the Mountain, also seems to first appear in New Hampshire at exactly the same time, at around 200 million years ago. And I looked forever today to look for a good figure that would demonstrate this for you. But back in 1992, there was a really nice compilation by E.B. and colleagues um, where they showed over in the Eastern Batholith, a nice figure with ages. So all of these numbers over here are ages for the granites that are found in the Eastern White Mountain Batholith. So right over here, um, these guys range from about 187 million years to 155 million years. And in the paper, and unfortunately it wasn't in the figure, so I couldn't put it in, but in the figure, in the paper, they also refer to many other ages from the Western Batholith over here, where um, Franconia Notch and the Old Man are, that have ages of rocks that are about 200 million years ago. So as all of these camp basalts, these are the, the dike locations, so the orientations of the dikes, these are the orientations of the dikes that are found in New Hampshire, these little black lines here. As those are all coming through, this rift-related basaltic magmatism is coming through North America at all about 201 million years ago, the White Mountain Batholith is also starting to come into the crust um, at around 200 million years ago. And so there's a lot going on in New Hampshire at around 200 million years. So, um, there are seeing this sort of correlation between the ages from that EB paper and the ages for um, the, the uh, camp flood basalts, you can see that there were clear um, ideas about how these might be related to each other. Okay. So um, the correlation of these camp flood basalts or these camp dikes that are coming through and the um, ages of the White Mountain Magma series led a lot of people to think that these two were clearly related. And so there are a few hypotheses for that came out of this 
um, for the origin of the White Mountain Magma series and the birth of the old man. The first hypothesis is that they are in fact camp related, that all of those basalts were flooding into the crust and that they were um, melting the crust around it and creating um, some pelsic magmatism. So some of this, this sort of volcanism and granite formation um, all in association with what we refer to as the plume head of the camp basalts. Um, but there were a few things that were not quite so clear about this. And one of them is that um, the White Mountain Magma series and all of these granites that dot all of New Hampshire are the only ones in the geologic record anywhere along the North American margin, anywhere in Africa or in South America, all the other places that experienced exactly the same camp-related basaltic magmatism, none of them have what we have in New Hampshire. None of them have a White Mountain Magma series to match it. So that was a little bit curious. Another thing that was a little curious about this camp um, relationship is that if you look, you can see the orientation of these dikes uh, is all sort of northeast southwest along the margin. But the orientation of the magmas in the White Mountain Magma series is pretty north south. So they're slightly oblique to what we think is the orientation of that um, rifting uh, of, and the, the emplacement of those basaltic magmas. So that's a little curious as well. So that led um, Bedard in 1985 to propose that this White Mountain Magma series, that all of those granites were actually formed um, due to extensional features related to zones of weakness where those ribbon continents, so again, remember the ribbon continents that formed the New Hampshire Plutonic Suite, like Mount Cardigan, where those ribbon continents were sort of thrust onto um, Pangaea and onto North America in the past. And so they thought, Bedard thought, maybe this is the only, the reason why the White Mountain Magma series is has this north-south trend and is the only area associated a lot of, of it globally at this time um, associated with camp has to do more with those pre-existing structures and pre-existing tectonics that um, that the area inherited from uh, 400 million years ago. And then not liking either of those two options, there was another uh, proposal by Eby in 1992 saying, actually, these are really long lived features, maybe 50 million years worth of, of magmatism associated with this White Mountain Magma series. So maybe it's not a, related to this one to a 1.5 million year event. And maybe it's not related to this extension, but it's instead some other unidentified thermal anomaly. And there are some good um, sort of pushes in that direction as well, so that I'll get to in a second. So one of the ways that we are approaching this is try to understand the birth of, of the old man and the origin of the White Mountain Magma series is to actually test these different hypotheses using zircon uranium lead age dating. So zircons are tiny, tiny crystals shown here. These are actual Conway, or no, actually these are Osceola granite. Um, so similar to the Conway granite, but instead of having biotite, it has hornblende. The Osceola granite um, zircons here. And when we look uh, using uh, sophisticated imagery techniques, we can see how these little grains grow. You have these sort of tree rings of growth in these zircon grains. And zircon is a fabulous mineral for age dating because it holds on to a lot of uranium and doesn't include a lot of lead. And so as uranium is radioactively decaying into lead, it will create a lead signature that then can be measured. So this is new data that we just got um, at the beginning of the summer for a uh, sample from the Osceola granite collected in uh, 2021 by a student of mine. And this data shows that that Osceola granite was emplaced at about 184.3 million years ago, plus or minus some uncertainty on there. So I just want to show you a little bit of data, even though this is a non-scientific talk. So this is what we wanted to look at. We took a bunch of, of samples of 
different parts of the White Mountain Batholith and used zircon uranium lead dating to be able to um, map out all of the ages and constrain whether this magnetism did indeed occur over a long period of time or was closer in age using these new high precision techniques was closer in age to that camp um, blood basalt uh, section. So this is the work of a PhD student at Columbia who finished in 2022. Um, he, uh, the, his name is Sean Kinney. Um, he is now a, uh, a research scientist at Rutgers University and down in New Jersey. Um, and what he showed, and we published this um, uh, again in 2022, and they showed uh, here in the White Mountain Batholith, and now the colored, colors are unfortunately changed a little bit, but the Conway granite is in gray here. The Osceola granite that I've been mentioning a few times is in yellow. And some of those Lafayette uh, cyanites and Albany quartz cyanites are here um, in this magenta color. And maybe some of you have heard of moat volcanics, the moat mountain volcanics. Uh, those guys are here in, in blue. And so what we showed was that the ages are very close indeed to that 201 time period, but a slightly younger. So ages for um, the old man in particular are about 198.5 million years. And a lot of the magnetism that occurs around this Western region of the Batholith occurs between about 198 down to about 190 million years ago. So we have concentrated magnetism in the area from 198 to 190, and then we take a pause. And we pause for a while, and it looks like the magmatic center jumps. It jumps over into the eastern Batholith. So over here is a place is places like Conway, um, Atatash is up here. Uh, these areas, Mount Mountain is down here. And it, it seems like the locus of magnetism appears to jump into the Eastern Batholith, where we start to get young, the uh, oldest ages of about 184 million years to about 179 or 180 million years ago. Okay, so this is what we, this is what we were looking at um, in 2022, some of the new really high precision zircon uranium lead ages to come out. So here's what I was showing. The Western Batholith appears to all come up between 198 and 190. So this is Old Man, Franconia, and so on. And the Eastern Batholith in place from about 184 to 180 million years. And now I'm also showing, as we started to dig a little bit deeper into what might this age progression actually mean, I um, am showing here the locations of possible volcanic centers that were identified by um, John Creasy, who was a, a professor at Bates College. Um, he did his PhD at Harvard in 1974 on this, uh, on this region. And he identified a few different volcanic centers labeled here W1, W2, W3, and E1, 2, 3, and 4. And these are um, identified on sort of this concentric or circular looking patterns in the map and in the context between um, different regions. And so he thought maybe these different volcanic centers were active at different times representing different parts of the magmatic system. So these, uh, uh, he called these ring dike complexes. And we, what we think of as ring dike complexes, um, they make these very characteristic sort of circular shapes. Um, we think what happens when you form a ring dike complex is that you have some basaltic magma that enters the crust, sort of ponds in a magma chamber in the middle crust. And then because this magma is buoyant, it can try to uh, escape along different faults um, and can frequently do that in sort of this um, caldera collapse type in, uh, environment where all of a sudden the overburden um, is is density unstable and will collapse down into the magma chamber and send the magma shooting out upward. So in each and every, so when we started to think about this concept of these ring dike complexes and the different types of magma and the different um, ages of all these different magma, we started to look a little bit closer 
And it looks like in each of those different volcanic centers, so that W1, W2, W3, it looks like they all have exactly the same progression of different rock types in each volcanic center. And so what we normally see happening is we first start with some volcanic or very near volcanic rocks. These are things that are called um, porphyritic cyanites. We can tell that they're volcanic because there's really fine grain material mixed in with some coarse crystals. Um, so that's what it's called porphyritic. And it uh, usually happens in, in volcanoes or uh, associated with volcanoes. This is a nice example of the Mount Lafayette porphyritic cyanite here looking out over Cannon uh, ski area up there. The next that seems to come in, in each of these volcanic centers is the Osceola granite. So the Osceola granite I've mentioned a couple of times. This is a granite similar to the Conway granite, except for that um, not having, it does not have biotite. It has a mineral called hornblende as its dark phase. So hornblende is shown here. Um, it can be usually identified differently from biotite in that it's not as flaky or shiny as the biotite. And the second or the third type of, of, of um, granite that comes in in each of these ring dike complexes uh, is the Conway granite. So that's that biotite granite. That's the what makes up this beautiful uh, Cannon Cliff region um, and that lovely picture from the museum um, of this area of Conway granite. And this is what biotite looks like here. So this is that flaky sort of shiny or mica material that um, is characteristic of this Conway granite. And this is what the old man is made up of. And so as we are looking um, at all of these different progressions, it seems like in the Western Batholith, we have a period of intense magmatism that erupts uh, volcanic rocks. And then um, those calderas fill in with these different granite types. First, the Osceola granite, and then the Conway granite. Um, then the volcanic center appears to move about 50 kilometers over to the east and start the whole progression again over in the east about 10 to 15 million years later. So um, I just want to briefly end with um, some evidence that we have from geophysical uh, data that we've been collecting um, throughout New Hampshire showing evidence for this magma chamber uh, or sort of a fossilized magma chamber. It's not active anymore, but a fossilized magma chamber of basaltic or um, dark material down in the middle crust. So here um, is New Hampshire, the state of New Hampshire here. Um, and these are what are called receiver functions. And I am not a geophysicist or an expert in any of this, but what I wanna draw your eye to is this blue line here. And the blue line has always a spike here, 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 and here that indicates the crust mantle boundary. Um, so that's the location of where the crust meets the mantle. But in the areas around the White Mountain Batholith and in around um, New Hampshire, we see another pulse of blue at about 18 to 25 kilometers within the crust. And this other pulse indicates that there must be some fossilized magma body of more of higher density or of, of basaltic magma that is sitting down there. And we don't see the same thing near the coast of Maine or in, uh, much farther up in Maine up here. So this is all preliminary data from uh, Jim Burke, who's also at Rutgers University right now, showing some evidence for this idea of a crustal basaltic magma chamber at about 20 kilometers depth that then gets tapped um, to, to um, emplace these granites uh, up near the surface. Okay, so I want to bring it back to the birth of the old man and talk a little bit and the end just about um, how we are going about this and what the different hypotheses, the pros and cons of these different hypotheses are for the birth of the old man. Um, <clears throat> so again, remember, I, uh, there was some hypothesis that this uh, granite magmatism is associated with camp. Um, what we showed in this 2022 paper um, from Sean Kinney is that those 
ages are very similar. There's even some ages of the White Mountain Magma series that I didn't highlight that are slightly older than that 201, um, uh, 201 million year camp flood basalt province. Um, there is some evidence of a geophysical evidence for a mid-crustal magma chamber of basalt. Um, and I also did not show uh, the isotopic character of the granites, but they are very mantle-like. So they look like they came from a basalt-like protolith. But again, we have that pesky problem of the, of the White Mountain granites being more north-south trending, whereas the dikes were northeast-southwest trending. And there are no other, the White Mountain seems very unique um, along the camp margin, uh, along all of that Pangaea breakup, but there's no other place where we get granites like the White Mountain um, Batholith or the, or old, the old man. Um, there is some evidence uh, from our work because we can show that this is a very long lived magmatic event that it doesn't have just one magmatic center, but that that magmatic center does actually move from west to east with time and north to south. So that might be um, a good evidence in, in support of a more extension related source related to different zones of weakness associated with those riven continents that had been previously um, attached to the continent. There's also um, a lot of similarities between some of the magmas that we see uh, in the White Mountain Magma series um, and these Rigendike complexes with other rift-related magmas, particularly um, in the Southwest United States associated with the Basin and Range province. So we get very similar types of magmatism forming today um, in that region due to extension. And then, of course, I mentioned that there is some idea of some other unidentified thermal anomaly, and that um, the, the evidence in support of that is similar, that there's this long-lived magmatic event. It's not just one pulse like the, the, like the basalts are, um, that there is a very mantle-like character, so they look like they come from a mantle-like source, um, and that New Hampshire appears to be very unique in the geologic record that there's frequently little blurps of magma, a granite magma coming up throughout the geologic history of New Hampshire that makes it a particularly strange reason, uh, region um, uh, along the, the North Atlantic coast, um, along the Atlantic margin, including, and I didn't mention this, but this third episode of New Hampshire granites that is possibly associated with a hotspot track that extends up here in um, Canada, comes down through over top of the White Mountain Batholith and keeps going offshore in what's known as the Great Meteor Hotspot, where you can see little volcanoes coming up through the Atlantic Ocean with time. Um, so to summarize, there are lots of different hypotheses for the birth of the old man. Um, but I don't think that we yet know which one is our preferred one. There's lots of different reasons to, to, uh, to side with many of these different ideas. Um, so with that, I will stop and take your questions. One of the questions that is, you, you should feel free, Jill, to say that this is like a question that's 200 million years after the time frame you study. Um, but one of the questions that uh, kind of persists in, in conversations about the old man is, when did it actually look like we knew it until 20 years ago? And is that something that your methodology or your research that you're doing um, can help us understand? Yeah, so that's, you know, that's, of course, a really good question. Um, you know, why do we have, th these all formed 200 million years ago in the crust somewhere, right? They were near the surface, but they didn't look like big mountains necessarily at that time. Um, I think, you know, during the, the last 200 million years, there's been a bunch of, of, of processes operating at the surface um, that have sort of created the topography and created the the landforms that we see today, a lot of that is 
um, glacial uh, activated. So a lot of that has to do with, you know, the ice ages um, and the formation of glaciers over the region. We know that like 12 to 14,000 years ago, that the entirety of um, New Hampshire, including the top of Mount Washington, was covered in glacial ice during the last uh, ice age. And so um, for sure, the old man was not there before that. <laughs> so between 12,000 and 200 years ago, when you know people first started documenting this face on the side of the cliff, um, sometime in that time period, <laughs> which I know is very uncertain, but um, that I think that's the best that I can do. Uh, yeah, that's the best that I can do. <laughs> well, now, I mean, you know, on the scale of, on the time scale that you work on, that seems like a fairly small margin, right? Like we were just oh, looking yeah. at plus or minus in, a, it was yeah. a, it was a number less than one, but I'm pretty sure it was still more than a million. So yeah, no, our uncertainties are like plus or minus 60,000 years, right? right. So <laughs> in that time span, <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, we don't, yeah. we can't measure that. That's that's like better than you're getting with with anything else you're doing. So, um, <laughs> so thanks. Um, so we have another question um, uh, about the the area. So in that, I don't know if you want to go back to the slide where it had the western batholith and the eastern batholith, and there's those kind of two curved lines, and then there's this big space in the middle. Um, yeah. And and so the question is. The question is, can you talk to us about that question mark? <laughs> yes. <laughs> What's yes. What's I, I, I feel like I must have planted this question because I didn't <laughs> get to actually um, address that in the talk. I was running a little short on time, but um, we think, so So the big question is, does this, does this volcanic center move, does it just jump from the west to the east, or does it sort of migrate slowly across? Um, and there is no data for this center region. And what you can see here is there's a really big bullseye in the middle here. This is called Heart Ledge. This is an area called Heart Ledge. It's actually really hard to get to um, for sampling, but it has all the same progression of rock types that the rest of them do. We have one sample and the age is not published yet, but I can let the cat out of the bag. It is 174 million years uh, million years old, and so it looks like it does not. The migration of the magmatic center does not sort of slowly creep eastward, but instead it jumps from west to east to center, and probably north to south, and up and down, all from Colebrook all the way down to Winnipesaukee. So it's jumping all over the place in the area, but we need to refine that age a little bit better. It has pretty high uncertainties. And so we wanna we wanna to give it another crack before we publish that. But thank you for that question. That's a great, you know, it is a it's an important part because if it was just migrating slowly across, that might imply a different tectonic source or a different sort of hypothesis was more likely than another one. Um so I, I realize now I'm looking again and I missed a part of the question, which was also um, about where in this map is Mount Washington. So I think. Yeah, Mount Washington's up here. So yeah. this is topography back here. One of these really high ones. <laughs> right. Okay. So it's. Yeah, so this is cool. This is Conway. Right. Um, this is the Kankamangas kind of coming through here. Uh, the highway comes like sort of cuts right through the middle of it. This is Waterville Valley. Um, and that area, and this is um, Cannon and Franconia Notch. I just know where all the ski resorts are on this. <laughs> <laughs> and the climbing, right? It's, it's yeah. like, um, so then uh, as a follow-up, I think, I think this was a follow-up to the, to the question about the question mark is the um, sort of how does the Ossipi range or where, when does the Ossipi range fit into this? Yes. Oh, I, I definitely planted this as well. So the Ossipi is actually sadly um, always lumped with the White Mountain Magma series uh, on lots of generalized geologic maps, um, but it actually turns out to be totally different. Um, and this is part of those uh, sections of the New Hampshire granites, that third um, 
uh, series called the New, uh, New England Quebec Province. So this is um, some work that we did again with Sean Kinney published in 2021. Um, and we looked at these uh, sort of plume related hotspot track um, uh, regions like the Mono Region Hills in Quebec, Ossipi here in this yellow color and Patakawea, um, which is also a state park down in the south, south of New Hampshire in this orange color down here. And you can see the ages on these are 122 million years and 124 million years. So they're totally different um, than, the, than the White Mountain Batholith and the White Mountain Magma series. Um, and they seem more connected to this general migration of a hotspot track through New Hampshire and out uh, into the Atlantic Ocean. So you can see these New England seamounts out here, all part of sort of a Hawaiian chain of hotspots that come through and Ossipi and Patakaway seem to be part of that sequence not at all related to White Mountain stuff. Yeah, thanks. Um, so then, okay, we have a Pangea question. Uh, so the, the um, person says, I've seen that. So I have two questions, one about Pangea. I've seen that graphic, I think meaning one of the ones you showed and I've always wondered what's on the other side of the globe. Oh yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so. Is it ocean? Does it have any impact on Earth's spin? Um, and then I think we get into the other question, which is the kind of chemical soup, or and maybe we can tie this in. So uh, when the chemical soup that makes up basalt, granite, feldspar, et cetera, erupts and makes the magma, or what makes the magma differentiate? So this is definitely a different question. Differentiate into the different rock types. So one oh, first great. question, what's on the other side? <laughs> Or what, what fills the rest of the globe there? Um, and does it impact the Earth's spin? Yes, this is a fabulous question. It totally impacts the Earth's spin. Um, so uh, we, on the other side, if all the continents are all on one side, right? There's a lot of mass that's sitting, sort of wobbling the Earth in a weird way. On the other side is just ocean crust. Um, so the oceanic crust is just six or seven kilometers thick. Um, whereas the continental crust can be 40, 45, between those 35 to 45 kilometers thick. So it's a huge bulge on one side, and it absolutely impacts the Earth's spin. And it uh, creates what we think is called um, true polar wander. And so when you have um, a, a, a supercontinent that all goes on one side, it can kind of change the rotation uh, a little bit of the Earth's magnetic field. Um, and that's a, it's a more of a paleomagnetic geophysical uh, explanation than maybe you want, but yes, it does definitely impact um, the, the spin. Great, thanks. And then um, what makes the differentiation uh, yeah. is a really good question. So um, that's another thing that I study very extensively is sort of how do you go from a dark black basaltic rock to a light white granite, right? And the way that you do that is by creating a magma chamber. And in that magma chamber, you start to crystallize different types of minerals. And those different minerals have different chemistry and different sort of temperature stabilities. And so as you take away the chemistry in those high temperature minerals, you leave behind the stuff that forms granites. So you, they're sort of like the scum on the top <laughs> is the granites um, that we think of uh, differentiating from the basalt. Thanks. Um, uh, so we have a caldera question. Um, is the Cape Horn caldera rim from the same period as the Conway granite formation? Oh, I don't, I don't know what the Cape Horn caldera. Um, I would have to, I would have to get back to that person. Okay, so Becky, you know how to find me to make sure we we get you an answer. So it's uh, <laughs> it's a it's a great friend of the museum who asked. So we can be sure to get that answer back to yeah, her. Yeah, absolutely. I've never heard of the Cape Horn Caldera, but I will look it up tonight. <laughs> um. So let's see. Um. So another another um, person is wondering about Monadnock and how that kind of fits into 
the the age age ranges we we've, we've heard about. Yeah, Manadnock, um uh I I don't want to say the wrong thing. So I'm gonna um I'm just I maybe I can also uh look that up um again. It's not associated with the White Mountain Magmatic series. Um but I don't remember exactly the timing of that one either. Um, it is, it's also not associated with the Ossipi in Pawtuckaway, um, New England, Quebec, I don't believe. So yeah, let me get back on that one as well. Um, I, that one is escaping me right now. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. So I think this is another kind of tectonic plate. We have another tectonic plate question. Mm -hmm. um, with the tectonic plates moving, was New Hampshire further south than it is today? Like, were the, was this ribbon further south? Yes. So that's a really good question. The, the, the whole thing is rearranging itself all over the latitudes, right? Um, so the ribbon continent actually, that ribbon continent um, very critically was in a sort of um, zero degrees latitude, sort of tropical region um, when that was all happening, all of that magnetism was happening. And we think that there's actually some indication that um, the, the uh, the formation of those of um, of that ribbon continent and sort of the abduction of that ribbon continent onto Gondwana and Africa, all around that latitude, actually contributes very significantly to CO two drawdown due to silicate weathering, and that is one of the causes for um, the Ordovician uh, climate change. Um, so Ordovician is about 400 million years ago. Um, there was a huge climate change associated uh, with the with the Ordovician, and we think that has actually a lot to do with the fact that that ribbon continent was around zero degrees latitude at the time. So Thanks. one of the one of the ways that you can draw down CO2 and make things colder is by weathering silicates like um, basalts and granites. Um, so back to the Cape Horn uh, caldera. It's near Groveton, New Hampshire, on the Connecticut River. And so uh, Becky says it's an outcropping above the Connecticut River, just southwest of where the upper Ammanusik joins in. Um, yeah, so that would be more part of the, um, the New Hampshire plutonic suite uh, stuff. Over on that side is usually where the, where the New Hampshire plutonic suite stuff comes out. Um, either that or the Olivarian. It could be associated with the Olivarian, which is even slightly a little, slightly older. Thanks. Um, that was a lot of questions that you answered. Like that was just so much information. <laughs> so um, I, I haven't even had a chance. So those of you here in person have questions. I've been, there was so much. Yeah, okay. Um, well, thanks Jill. It's well after eight o'clock now. Oh, we do have one question in person, yeah. Yeah. We uh, we listened to Mark Ogren the last event, and I had a, a nice conversation with him on the telephone. Joe, would you uh, entertain and discuss a little bit the uh, the possibilities of a, a new man of the mountain to replace the old man? In other words, a Mount Rushmore type of a project. Oh, Could wow. You, yeah, is that so, on the table? <laughs> I, I, I think that that, uh, that every geo, for, with every geologist I've spoken to, it's not on the table. I think that that interested, they're definitely interested parties. So the, um, you know, so, so yeah, that's that's a little context, Joel. Um, for those, I, I hope everyone on Zoom could hear. The question was about um, uh, a kind of new man of the mountain and the um, the the sort of uh, what what Jill's perspective on that might be um, from a from the perspective of an igneous petrologist. And and Jill, <laughs> you should feel free to take a pass as it's also a hundred and seventy four million years more recent than than your. <laughs> 
<laughs> then you research area. <laughs> I mean, if if somebody wants to carve a uh, old man of the mountain, I a, a new man of the mountain, I would um, recommend doing it not on Conway granite. Um, I would recommend doing it maybe more in the in the meta sediments like in Mount Washington or Rumney Rocks or something like this, you know, where where that has a little bit better chance of sticking around for a little longer. That's, I, I guess that's all I would say, but I would love to see that. <laughs> well, thanks, Jill. And um, if you have a second, you should look at the chat. There are lots of um, thank yous and appreciation for uh, a kind of new view that that you've provided folks, um, many of whom I know uh, have have been thinking about the White Mountains for a long time. And so this was a, a great new perspective um, for them and, and for me too. So thank you very much. Um, it's it's um, great to, to hear about your research and, and you know the work you're doing, bringing students up here to, to spend time in the mountains. So yeah, thank thanks you. Thanks so much. It's been a real pleasure. Um, and I'm sorry that I couldn't be there in person today, but yeah, I am. I'm always happy to talk about the White Mountains and about geology. So if anybody wants to reach out, I, I'm, I'm around. And um, for those of you on Zoom, Jade is going to put a link in the chat to a survey to let us know what you thought about um, tonight's talk. Any you know follow up questions you have, um, feel free to put them in there. I'll make sure that that they get to Jill. Um, and, you know, again, our, our lecture series this summer um, was supported by the New Hampshire Humanities, um, but our exhibition that, that this all goes along with and all of the other programming that we do here at the museum is supported by our members. And so it's because of the generosity of, of our members that we're able to put on um, this big exhibition this summer about the Old Man of the Mountain. And with the support of New Hampshire Humanities, we've been able to really push the boundaries of, of what we think about when we think about the old man of the mountain. And um, I can't say that, you know, a year and a half ago when we started this project that I thought I was going to be spending a Thursday night in August thinking about 200 million year old rock formations and how they fit with the old man of the mountain. Um, but this was a, a real pleasure. So thank you so much, Jill. And thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you.